I started working on this uh, a few projects around uh, uh, catchment management surveys and frogs came into that part of it. I was the, the fauna monitoring person and frogs featured quite a lot there. So, um, and then I gradually moved into this program called Frog Watch, which, start, which started back in about 92, um, on the back of um, the, the rising concern globally about the disappearance of frogs. And so uh, frogs became a bit of a focus for me, which was really good because, as, and as Kaz mentioned, it gave me a, an opportunity to work with community and uh, develop a few other skills that I hadn't really had at the time around communicating the importance of conservation for wildlife and, and frogs became that kind of focus. Because frogs, and like Damien mentioned earlier, um, you know, frogs are a bit of a, a, an indicator of environment, if you like, a bit of a uh, frog in the uh, canary in the gold mine. So uh, frogs, yep, they come along and oh, at the time I was finishing off my degree studies and I did uh, a bit of a pre-honours project on frogs and salinity and the north central region was a really good focus for that. And the north central region, as Elaine also pointed out, was, has 30% of Victoria's frog species. So a good representation of frogs and, and a good range of um, issues and uh, ways of communicating the conservation message using frogs. So uh, I, I thought then uh, I, I could keep focusing on frogs in north central Victoria and and bring in my other interests around other wildlife as well. So it kind of evolved from there and now I've kind of moved into a combination of working with, as, my, as the coordinator for Land for Wildlife, communicating uh, wildlife concerns and conservation issues to people all over the place and you know, helping a team of uh, fro uh, Land for Wildlife coordinators or extension officers around Victoria, which Terry's one of them. And um, so it's, it's managed to kind of get into a situation where I can blend my uh, skills and interest in wildlife and frogs and, and communicating messages to uh, people about the conservation concerns. So a little bit of a background there and, um, and then I might move now into what the talk is really all about. And, and uh, there's four main areas that I'll, I'll try and cover. Um, identification, reproduction, habitats and detection. And I think in the, uh, the little bit of background blurb there, uh, it says uh, distributions in the north central CMA region and methodology for frog monitoring. And I'll try and cover as much of that as I can. Without, and it, it probably helps to be a little bit repetitious from previous speakers. So I'll, I'll uh, get started on that. Thanks, Terry. So in that, actually in that previous slide, if we just go back for a second, um, frogs are basically part of the class of vertebrates called amphibia. Um, vertebrates have a backbone. Frogs are basically uh, one of the um, most basic vertebrates known. And actually, a couple of months ago, the smallest vertebrate animal, well, a fish was known to be the smallest vertebrate animal. Uh, I think it was about 10 millimetres. I can't remember the species name, but in New Guinea, I think it was New Guinea, uh, two species of frog were found um, living on the rainforest floor, which were around seven to eight millimetres in size. So not much bigger than, than that. Um, so frogs are officially the, one of the smallest living vertebrate animals known. So they belong to the class amphibia. And basically what that means is that they live, they have a life on land and water. Uh, they, they rely on water for breeding, so they've got to have some sort of allegiance with water somewhere. Basically, you can divide frogs up into two types, land frogs and tree frogs, or if you like, frogs that uh, have more dependence on water, whereas other frogs don't have as much dependence on water, but they still need to have some sort of watering environment to have their eggs uh, develop in. So essentially, uh, I might just look a little bit over to remind myself about some of these characteristics of frogs. Frog, and Elaine's gone through quite a bit of uh, what the frog physiology is all about. You know, they have um, feet for swimming or climbing or digging. Um, 
And, and the main difference between frogs and toads is that frogs basically hop and toads basically crawl. Um, that's a very simplified way of telling them the two types apart, if you like. So frogs are swimmers, good climbers, uh, good burrowing and, and uh, good at jumping. And it was interesting, I didn't really put it into context that frogs, uh, well we are kind of, we'd have to jump 16 metres to be like a frog if we put it down to their size. So essentially frogs, frog legs are adapted um, if they're a swimmer for uh, having uh, strong back legs and, and good webbed feet and uh, more than uh, their hands. Um, climbing they'll have good grasping hands. For digging they'll have strong um, back feet that are, have got hardened pads and good strong back legs for digging into soil. And for jumping again they'll have strong back legs but uh, more for that, that the power of, of jumping away from a potential predator. Thanks, Terry. So, uh, frogs rely essentially, as I said, on water for breeding. Some frogs, like Bibrin's toadlet, um, it essentially lives in uh, damp uh, leaf litter in the forest and uh, it'll lay its eggs uh, in that sort of situation and when there's a bit of a, a rain event or there's water around moving through, uh, those eggs may get washed into a deeper depression or into some other area of water. Um, so um, essentially they, even those, these so-called land frogs rely a lot on water for breeding. So if you have a look at a, a pond, and uh, Damien gave a great example before in his, one of his slides. Um, this is a very much more simplified version of, of um, a frog habitat, if you like. So um, around the edges of a of a, a pond, which normally ponds should be gently sloping, not steep-sided. You'll have um, verges of reeds, and uh, you, or you could have other plants that are emerging out of the water. Um, you can have some plants and twigs and uh, sticks and things in the water. All of these kind of features are there so that uh, frogs can latch onto and, and deposit their eggs in. So in the reeds, with uh, things like uh, pobble bonk or um, spotted marsh frog, the frog that goes, which Elaine uh, demonstrated earlier, they, all these frogs will generate a, a, thro a frothy foam mass, a bit like the, um, you know, the soap suds in your dishwashing tub. Um, and they generate that foaming mass with their back leg, paddling action on their back legs, and that's usually in the reeds. So you'll see these sort of clumps of white foamy mass. That's usually uh, things like uh, pobble bonk or um, some of the other marsh frogs. Um, some of the other frogs will leave their eggs in jelly masses uh, just under the surface attached to submergent vegetation. Others will leave them in strings, if you like, in pearl strings. Um, attached to sticks in the water or submerged vegetation as well. Um, others will have just single eggs floating around or in the leaf litter if you like and then that might get washed into a water body. That's a simplified representation of reproduction in frogs and, and how they uh, dip, lay their eggs and, um, and uh, safeguard them. I mentioned earlier that uh, we have land frogs and tree frogs uh, the land frogs are basically the frogs that um, don't have as high a dependence on water initially. Uh, they're, they're quite happy to um, roam around in, on the edge of a swamp, if you like, or a wetland. Um, and a lot of those species can belong in the central region, north central catchment area. Um, they belong to the uh, genus Limnodynastes. Limnodynastes is a, a group of frogs that uh, are basically lords of the marshes, if you like. So, pobble bonk, it's a bit hard to, to think that they can be a lord. You look at them and, you know, they look really warty and lumpy and, and um, not always um, something that everyone likes to, to uh, aspire to looking at, except for frog enthusiasts, of course. And so, limnodynasties, limno means 
living on the edge of the water. Um, and Di Dionysus is kind of really saying um, belongs to um, royalty. So Lord of the Marshes, and I reckon something like Popplebonk is definitely a lordy looking frog, you know, with a white, lip, the goldy sort of lippy coming down the side and um, those golden flecks and um, other sort of colours that are uh, not bright but nice, royal sort of looking um, important colours. And they can look, stand up and, and uh, look at you uh, in the face and say, well, listen to me. <laughs> And, you know, we, we've heard the call before, bonk, 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 and you hear them sometimes in the in a pond and they can sound like a bit of an orchestra of banjos and their other name is banjo frog. And then we have common spadefoot toad, which can more or less resemble the sound of a pump going off in the paddock so after uh, lots of water. So they'll come out of the soil um, after a rain event and... If you go out on a nice warm night, it doesn't have to be a warm night either, it can just be any night where there's been lots of rain, but usually on the back of a warm period, and they'll be going out in the paddock, boop, 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 and you think, oh, that's a strange call, until you go out and have a look, and and these um, interesting little critters come up, and they have the, um, I'll talk a little bit about the pupil shapes before, but Elaine mentioned it earlier, Has the, they have the vertical pupil. So, and the tree frogs, well, they differ again. Um, they'll have this um, uh, slightly different way of getting about. Um, they usually clamber through vegetation or um, in trees or anywhere that um, is off the, off the land, off the ground. Uh, and so they'll have their, their feet structure will be more like pads on their, on their fingers. And um, I'll show you a picture of those early and you've, and you've already seen some of those with the lane slides. But uh, essentially, things like growling grass frog and uh, parents tree frog and um, Ewing's tree frog, striped marsh frog, um, and the other marsh frogs don't have these pads. They just have fingers, if you like, for clambering around on the ground. So the tree frogs, they have pads on their fingers. And it's uh, not so much about them, their fingers being suction caps, but it's more about how they, um, the, the water tension between their, their pads or f expanded fingertips on, on a smooth surface, allowing them to get, um, have a grasp. So it's more about um, the stickiness of uh, the, water, the water tension between the, the foot and the, and the, and the, and the reed or, the, or whatever they're clambering on, or glass even. So popple bonk again, and then we've got spotted marsh frog, and striped marsh frog. They're the clambering frogs, if you like, or the lords of the marshes that uh, live on the edge of the water and come to the water to breed with uh, using the, putting their eggs into the reeds. So it's essential for, you, for any frog habitat development that you have areas where there's shallow water where these reeds can grow. The, the reeds will grow in water that possibly down to a foot depth um, or 30 centimetres, if you like, um, much steeper than that, and uh, you may not get as much growth. You'll get things like kumbungi growing, but and they'll tend to take over a bit more than uh, the rushes and other reeds. So it's usually those reeds that are about that sort of, well, they can be that sort of high and um, can take over the edge of a, of a wetland or a pond or whatever it is you want to call your little wetland. So some locations in the north central region, when I first started looking at um, the influence of salinity on the distribution of frogs, um, I looked at a whole range of areas and uh, the, the location around uh, Kerrang and Kahuna and Bort seemed to be fairly good examples of sites that I could use to get an idea about um, how salinity was affecting the distribution of frogs. In, in the north central area, and uh, you know, there's a range of there are a range of sites. Things that ranged from uh, sites that had salinity three or four times that of seawater up to bodies of water that were pretty much equivalent to or just a little bit higher than um, the freshness of tap water. And 
through that range of water types, uh, you get uh, corresponding vegetation types that uh, will respond to that salinity. And I found that um, as you move from fresh water towards the salinity, the really saline end, um, it didn't take long for uh, the salinity of the water to influence the reduction in the numbers of plant species that would be found in this water body. And around about, we talk about EC um, as a measure of salinity in water, and you find that tap water is around three or 400 EC, so you can pretty much say, you know, you can taste, taste how fresh tap water is, and frogs will thrive in that sort of salinity level and so will their tadpoles, and so will pretty much all of the uh, species of plants that they rely on to uh, deposit their eggs and um, for the tadpoles to uh, find good food in as well and, and cover. But then as you move down through the, um, the spectrum of salinity, you get to 1500 EC, which is only you know five times that of tap water, and you start having three quarters of the plant species dropping out. So you've only got a quarter of the plant species that you originally had at, at tap water strength remaining. So it doesn't take much, and you can just barely taste the, uh, the salinity in that water. Um, so it's not even what you would call brackish, I guess. It, you can barely taste it. So it doesn't take much to start for a salinity to start affecting uh, the way frogs can interact with their habitat. So locations like uh, Third Marsh and Reedy Swamp, they have, uh, their salinity ranges are, are around about 900, well, when I was doing my work, was around 900 to 1000 EC. And there are a range of species in there that seem to be quite happy with it at that level. But, um, and, and if we go to the next slide, then you go to a location like Cullen's Lake where the salinity is up, you know, up around uh, seawater, there are absolutely no frogs to be found, but in the water channels at the rear, um, you can see um, on the top left slide there, you, um, that irrigation channel had lots of spiny rush along the bank of it. Now the water in there was uh, a, around 500 EC, but it only had spiny rush growing on the edge of it, and it was really steeply banked. So, um, I found about two species in there. There was common eastern froglet and um, it's so long ago now, I can't remember the other one, to be honest. Um, but essentially they were there, but there, was no, there were no frog, uh, no tadpoles present. But in this one here, which is uh, Murphy's Swamp, it was what you would call brackish water. And the salinity in there was a bit over, it was around 1800 to 2000 AC, and there were Fletcher's frogs in there, or barking marsh frog if you like, Limnodynastes fletcheri, um, uh, calling from in here. But there was only really uh, a few rushes and uh, I think cooch grass at the, growing through the, this area as well. So there was a sort of um, very simplified vegetation and, and habitat structure in, the, in, in this particular wetland. And, and Cullen's Lake was just over the back, basic. Well, not Cullen's, sorry. Um, the other half of Murphy's was really more of a saline um, depression as well. So this part of Murphy's was being fed by um, this sort of freshwater channel. So while there were frogs calling in here, and there was a lot of frogs, like a, a lot of calling from barking marsh frog and um, common eastern froglet, uh, there was absolutely no evidence of any breeding. There were no, no frog eggs, no tadpoles, nothing in there. The water was crystal clear, um, but um, there, were, there, were no, no, there was no breeding. So it, it's, it seemed that while the, the water was okay for the frogs to be there, it's a bit like the, you know, the gradual um, immersion of a frog in water and you heat it up to a boiling point, they hardly even notice until the last minute. <laughs> um, they can stick around, but 
saline water is, is kind of similar in that sense. They'll, they'll stick around in this brackish water, but as soon as it starts getting too saline, they'll be off out of it because, you know, their skin is like this organ that relies on, um, gives them the ability to breathe and gives them a barrier between the external and, and their internal environments. And, and so um, a, a salty environment is just not going to help them breathe or, or, or um, allow their skin to um, function as a normal healthy organ. So and, and quite apart from being able to survive as individual animals, there's just absolutely no way or no reason for them to be there to, to breed. So essentially the wetlands that really are basic habitat for, wild, for frogs is anything that's going to be less than 1500 EC, so water that you can barely taste the salt in. Some of the other threats around that affect uh, frog habitat, you see on that slide there that I've already talked about salinity being a major threat to um, the presence of frogs, but there are other issues that came up, is, um, and thankfully there's not much of this happening now, there's a little bit of it still happening, but draining of wetlands for agricultural purposes. A lot of this happened in uh, uh, the mid-1900s, and around the 50s, 60s and 70s, and then the, um, the use of fertilisers and pesticides and, and domestic stock. So we find that um, these kind of issues on their own are enough, but when they're combined and, and you have a combination of threats happening, it's quite devastating on, on um, habitat for frogs. So in this example on the left there, where um, you know, you've got a couple of um, essentially um, dams or ponds that have been um, allowed for cattle to access at different times, you can see here that cattle have been excluded and um, the, the water has built up and there's been a, a good development of vegetative habitat. We've got the emergent plants and, and there's a lot of submergent plants in there and um, it's, it's generally um, not steep sided so the, so the water bodies are coming in gently. And then um, cattle come in and uh, and this, is, this can be the uh, effect of cattle pugging the water and, and this is also combined with drying out. So the drought years haven't had a great impact on, or a great, hasn't been really great for frog habitats. And there's probably been a high level of increasing um, salinity in there too, to a certain extent because as water dries up the salts concentrate. Um, and so there may have been some level of uh, fertiliser or pesticide runoff into these as well over time. So these sorts of threats combined uh, don't bode well for the survival of frogs or the longevity of their habitat as being suitable for um, uh, the frog survival. And just on, on the um, question of, of how water bodies dry up or puddles start drying, and how it affects salinity. Uh, there, there is, was some work done that showed how um, uh, tadpole development can speed up if they detect increasing salinity in a water body that didn't show that high level of salinity original, originally. So I think the work was done in South Australia where um, they found that um, tadpoles that were exposed to saline and were, were essentially growing in a freshwater body, but as that freshwater body dried up and the salts increased, the tadpoles kind of sped up their their uh, their development rate and were able to essentially beat the, the rising salinity and get out. I don't know if there's been much follow-up work on that. I'm, kind of been a little bit out of the frog research scene or frog scene for on a continuous basis for a few years now as, as I've moved into other areas. Just talking about conservation issues and threats around frog survival. Um, essentially, um, we, you know, we, while, while there's been lots of work done on frog ecology and frog biology, physiology and certain aspects of frog life, we still have, in this, and, and really in the North Central region, there's still a lot of um, 
a little known about frogs. Their ecology is still, there's still areas of their ecology that we need to know a lot more about. So we, we can help, we can understand and uh, what are the needs of frogs and what do we need to, to manage for a better outcome. So things around, aspects around uh, water management, uh, how do we um, communicate the importance of environmental water um, and what are the balances between what uh, the agricultural sector need and, and what the environment needs. And, and this can be reflected by, um, you know, the distribution of frogs re, uh, responding to uh, the availability of water in the environment when it's when it's there, and and you know over the years we've had little different periods of really wet periods. We know 2011, and even the start of this year was kind of wettish. But you go back to '93 as well, and in the north central region there was a a, a fairly big flood event, and we were doing some surveys around south of Barma and <clears throat> and uh, we had uh, pitfall buckets out and we were literally catching thousands of frogs in pitfalls and over a, a period of a few nights and you go out of an evening and there'd just be literally be millions of frogs calling. It was literally quite deafening. So water, environmental water, good quality environmental water is essential for the survival of frogs and, and that's a fairly, you'd think that was a fairly obvious uh, intuitive thing to, to know. And then, you know, we, we still have this ongoing loss of habitat and habitat fragmentation or breaking up. So when we talk about frogs and frog habitat, it's those water bodies and the linkages between them. So a lot of the larger wetland water bodies have been, have become isolated, have, have become, if you like, um, kind of the reverse of islands, but water bodies being the islands themselves in the landscape. And and there's been a lot of uh, grazing at, uh, over, you know, over historic times where people have moved in and and taken up uh, the opportunities for, for cropping and grazing and whatever other agricultural activities have, have happened in the north central region down in the, the, the lower end of the catchments mainly. So that's, that's pretty much broken up the landscape between what was really essentially a wetland landscape. And wetlands are really poorly represented in the public reserve system. So we might have a whole collection and a whole range of Ramsar wetlands, those wetlands that are uh, protected by international treaties up around Kerrang and Bort and that end of the, the north central area. But essentially, um, it's private land areas that are representing um, what we have left of wetlands. And it's really quite essential that uh, people with on private land, on acreage, um, understand that, you know, they're living in a landscape which historically uh, would have supported water at different times of the year. And, and because water has been, the distribution of water in the landscape has, has been modified and changed and through think activities like drainage and um, building dams and redirection and and um, just uh, leveling of of properties <laughs> at, at different times and things like um, um, irrigation farming, all these sorts of things have contributed to how the distribution of water has has affected the distribution of water over time. So um, you know. This extensive habitat loss and fragmentation has, has been going on for uh, many, many decades. And I guess now we're coming to a point where we're understanding the importance of water in the environment. And how, it, how it's beneficial, not just for frogs, but for uh, water birds and, and other critters as well. So, you know, the land uses that, are, that pose threats to frogs, we've, I've already touched on that, the drainage of wetlands and and how that how that affects the the uh, the distribution of wetland bodies. And I think Damien mentioned earlier about uh, shallow freshwater marshes. Well, the, the the north central region has a whole cross section of wetland types from the shallow fresh well from essentially meadows, if you like, areas that are relatively flat or really really shallow uh, depressions in the landscape. And and these are the um, the meadow type wetlands. 
then you, you can move into the shallow freshwater wetlands, which are slightly more scooped and deeper. And then you can move into areas that are, um, are deeper, the deeper or shallow freshwater marshes like Third Marsh and um, Reedy Swamp and um, other areas like that. And I've, I've got a few other slides there on those. So, um, and then you can have those water bodies that are more saline and, and other water bodies that are man-made, so like, like your dams and larger pondages. So private wetlands can support a whole range of these sorts of wetland types. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the meadow wetlands, if you like, they're really, really temporary uh, features. Um, they're usually pretty much uh, uh, cropped or grazed uh, throughout their whole life cycle, if you like. And the, the slightly deeper um, uh, meadow uh, areas that are um, may have water in them at uh, one time of the year or, or every every few years where there's a major rain event, they would be less inclined to be uh, used for cropping or grazing. But so they have the potential for supporting uh, or being isolated off or fenced off, if you like, and and um, maintained as a uh, a temporary wetland or as we call sometimes e ephemeral wetlands. And so you can move into the and then move into those shallow freshwater marshes again. And if they could be fenced off from grazing pressure or cattle coming in or, um, and then um, protected with a buffer zone around them, then I think there's a chance of, uh, for the private land system to be managing these uh, uh, temporary, or, you know, relatively temporary water bodies as well. Because they're the ones, the temporary, that the shallow to slightly deeper freshwater marshes are the ones that are really providing the the habitat, the ongoing habitat for things like frogs and whether, particularly where they've got trees around them and um, other supporting uh, components of habitat. So uh, where do you find frogs or how do you detect them? You go out on warm humid nights following rain and uh, you can Position yourself on the edge of a wetland, and where I said earlier you'd have reeds coming up through the edges of wetlands, and then you, you may have some tree cover with branches overhanging. These are all different parts of a, of a pond or a wetland where you may find frogs. And so you can focus on these areas, but it's probably useful to, to have an idea about what they look like if you go and have a visit during the daytime, and then work out where you're going to sit and, and uh, position yourself. So. You can have frogs calling from in the reeds, on the edge here, or up in the trees. So you could have Perham's tree frog up here, or you could have banjo frog, pop -bon out here in the reeds, or spotted marsh frog out here as well. Or you can have common eastern frog on the, on the edges as well. Um, so you want to think about where you sit. And the triangulation method, Elaine gave a really good example of that earlier. Um, and you want to be listening for the calls and have a, uh, a call tape with you that you may want to um, refer to. And your length of survey time, well, it's really as long as you want to sit around and enjoy what you're listening for or what you, the purpose of your, your, um, you know, your um, survey is about. So, but I would say a minimum of um, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, depending on the time of year. So. In winter you might need to sit there longer, but in summer or spring time, short periods of time is all you, you would need.